My job this morning is to take you through the five themes. We start at the very beginning. We start with the first thousand days. Between conception and a child turns two is roughly a thousand days. And any of us could live to be a hundred, but we'll never again see that kind of concentrated impact over our lives. Those first thousand days are very much the first coat over our entire life's canvas. And if we get it right, it paints a very different picture for our children's future. We know that environmental stressors during pregnancy, obesity, smoking, having poor nutrition of mom, that these are woven into that child and woven into that child's future. Many risk profiles that later show up in adult life first appear during those first thousand days. And we also know the impact of early learning in those early days. By age three, high income households, a child living in that household will be, have been exposed to 30 million more words than a child of three from a lower socioeconomic household. Not surprisingly, this affects academic performance, which in turn affects employment outcomes. So many chapters of our life sit at the intersection of health, of income, of opportunity, but almost none are as impactful as the first. That's why we're very pleased to have the first thousand days as one of our topics for discussion and for action, and we're thrilled to have the open dialogue around this topic today. Getting our foundations right, that leads us to our next topic. Every year, between 100,000 and 150,000 people more call this region home. That's tens of thousands more toilets flushing, cell phones charging, showers running, and people on our transportation systems and roads. The reality is, our cities are growing and much faster than the services that feed them. And this is a global problem. In fact, over the next 15 years, it's expected that $57 trillion will be needed to fund that infrastructure gap. We've got a piece of that pie here at home, and it's a big one, but we're doing something about it. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some truly historic investments on the infrastructure front. These are warmly welcomed because these are absolutely critical. Not only are we seeing increases in density, we're also seeing a new era of weather intensity. Floods that used to happen every 40 years now come every six. And when all but four days in February are extreme cold, it's hard not to recognize extreme weather as our new normal. That's a very expensive reality. The insurance claims in 2013 across this country were in around $3.2 billion. Ice storms, rainstorms, each of these add tens of millions of dollars to the expense pile, but it's essential that this planning get factored in. Because to our cities, infrastructure is not just a key budget line. Infrastructure is part of our lifeline. The infrastructure supports that we need through our entire lives leads us to our third topic. And that is matching seniors' health care to housing options. The number of people aged 75 and above who live in the greater Toronto Hamilton area will triple over the next several years between now and 2040. And while it's on the rise, senior assisted living space in this region only, re only represents about 5% of the population. It doesn't take much to do the math and realize we're going to have a problem. And when you factor to that problem the reality that many seniors are on fixed income, many are taking higher levels of debt into retirement, then it becomes clear that for many the golden years will be anything but. In lieu of supported living spaces, hospitals are filling the gap. But a hospital bed should never be a home address. And at $1,300 a bed a day, that's a very expensive plan B. Ideal hospital capacity should be at 85%, but already today we're sitting at or above capacity. So how can we encourage new forms of living arrangements and what kind of supports do families and their, and their seniors need? The stress of answering some of these questions is felt not only by our seniors, but by the families that support us, which compounds an already growing problem and in fact our fourth theme, mental health, but in particular, mental health in the workplace. Back in your home work environments, you'll probably find a first aid kit. You'll no doubt have an evacuation plan if an emergency were to strike. But the reality is many workplaces don't have a deep familiarity with mental health first aid or what we need to do to tackle it. When you look at the numbers, it's shocking because this is in fact a frontier of much needed support. 
One in three Ontarians over our lifetime will either struggle with mental health or substance abuse pro problems, and fewer than one in three of those folks will get help. The state of our collective mental health is something we all need to talk and do more about. And th this suffering has hard personal costs that extends beyond the individual, but into their families. Mental health is being considered by some to be the secondhand smoke of my generation. There's also hard economic cost to this suffering. We know that lost productivity across Canada due to mental health sits around $51 billion a year. For comparison's sake, that is the size of Canada's food services and accommodation sectors combined. As employers and colleagues, we are, there are aspects of this epidemic that are within our influence, if not control. Where managers have been trained to better support their employees, we've seen a 20% drop in disability-related costs for that organization. Our full lives do not begin or end at our workplace front door. So our ability to support anyone struggling with mental health needs to know no purview of place either. And speaking of places, our fifth and final theme, public space. 90% of our lives are lived indoors. But it's in fact that 10 where much of the magic happens and that's the best for us. Accessible, affordable public spaces are as critical to our well-being as breathing. They make us healthier, more social, and simply put, they, they increase over our, overall our lifestyle and our health. As our populations swell, the need for this public space also grows. The average size of a condo being built downtown Toronto is about 685 square feet. That's dropped by 200 square feet between 2008 and 2013. 42% of Torontonians live in apartments. 27% of Hamiltonians live in apartments. As our backyards give way to balconies, the need for public spaces has never been felt more. And when you add to that the reality of our physical fitness rates, they're nothing to write home about. Adults across this country, only 15% of us get the physical activity we need. It's worse for our kids. It sits around five. So we know for many, many reasons we need to get out, we need to get active, and we need public spaces to be able to do it in. We're thrilled to see this topic discussed at the summit in the months to come. There are many ways that these five topics weave their way through our life. Ultimately, these are about shaping our people, their health, and our communities. Today is about bringing a big thinkers, all of you in the room, all of you following along at home, bringing together big thinkers for a day of dialogue. But what it spurs for us starts really tomorrow and for the next four years. This cracks open a new era of action for civic action. And as Rod said, and we like to say, we are civic action, not civic chit chat. So with that in mind, we encourage you to push the envelope. Bring your creative solutions to some of these big urban challenges that need an all-hands-on-deck approach.